Welcome to the 145th episode of the Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast. So damn paranormal. My name is Jason Knight, host of the show. And with me, as always, is Oscar Spector, producer extraordinaire and podcast Mm co-host. Listeners, if you'd like to skip our intro, go to the show notes. There'll be a timestamp there waiting for you. To get you to the topic. And it'll lead you right back to here. (laughs) That's right. Listen to the intros. (laughs) Yeah, listen to the intros. Damn it. Yeah. Yeah. You know you love us. You want to know what's going on in our lives. Creepers. (laughs) No, we're not. We're insulting them for listening (laughs) to the intro. I think think this is mixed messaging going on here. Yeah, that was a little. Well, what are you going to do? You sound sound like a like a trauma, like a like an abusive parent. Oh, so that's a that's a abusive, manipulative stuff you d- you're doing there. Okay. Wow. Um, just saying. Terrible. Just saying. I'm sorry. I saw sharp objects. This is bad. Um, how are you? I'm uh, doing okay. Been coming off, you know, busy week. Very busy week at work. Boring stuff. Although I did, I did start a project. I don't know if I should mention it here. Yeah, I'll mention it here. You did bit. jazz hands as you as you I did. did. <laughs> it was a project jazz hands. Yeah. There you go. So I started a Halloween project, Oscar. Mm. And I am building starting early. Yes, starting early because it's going to take a lot of work. Okay, but I'm building a life size, movie accurate Jason Voorhees from Friday the Thirteenth Part Four, the final chapter. Part and Four. Okay. Yes, it wasn't the final chapter. <laughs> it was. Yeah. It was supposed to so, be, but so bad. And then, like a I year later, when movies call themselves when they, the titles have the word last. Yeah. Or final. Yep. Because if it's not, you're fucking it up. You know? Well, that's right. Because like a year later, they came out with the new beginning. So boom, there you go. Yeah. Well, yeah, in recent history, like The Last Exorcism. Right? A oh, good yeah. movie. I thought it was a fine movie. Um, they made a part two. <laughs> How is it The Last Exorcism? It's a terrible title now. It really is. It just ruined that movie for me. Sorry. Continue. This no, is awesome. Then- this is awesome, by the way, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And that's kind of what the way this, you know, Friday the 13th part four is the final chapter, kind of the same thing, but it did. Mm-hmm. And it went on for what, another six, I believe. At least. At least. But uh, yeah, life size, movie accurate, Jason Voorhees for my front lawn for Halloween. Uh, and I'm actually chronicling the build, uh, kind of a video journal for Patreon. And I'll, I'll release uh, sometime in October as an extra bonus. For October yeah. on Patreon, the build of this yeah. thing, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be cool. I'm really cool. excited, and yeah. I know how crazy you are, so it'll, it'll it'll look nice, I'm sure. Thanks. Not to add more pressure. But, no, if I, yeah. no, no, because <laughs> I know how people are like that sometimes. Like, oh man, I can't wait for that. I'm like, shit, now I really gotta do it right. You know, that's right. right. No, yeah, so I'm no, excited this, about this. This is cool. How are you gonna make him um, last size, right? So, how tall is Jason Voorhees? Oh, <laughs> taller than me. Um, well, every, everyone's he's, taller than you. <laughs> he's especially uh, as the movies progress, he gets really ogreish, uh, really. <laughs> yeah, he big does. I mean, bulky, different actors play him, and, bulky. Yeah, right, and stuff. So, part four. Then, how what, how tall is he in part four? I would say he's got to be at least six, 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 seven. That's what I'm guessing. Yeah. And as I assume, that's him. That's how tall you're going to make him, right? Yeah. So yeah. He, he's. Part of a mannequin, I have to modify some things on the mannequin to get it the size I need. Mm-hmm. But I'll chronicle that whole thing for Patreon. Yeah. Put lips on him and shit, you know. <laughs> lips and eyelashes. No, I mean lifts like, you know. The oh, they said lips. <laughs> no, no, no. Lifts to make him tall. We're talking about tall. And, uh, um, you know, to elevate his uh, stature or like just put him on top of a bunch of phone books. Right. Well, I mean, you can do all sorts of cool things if you, uh, if it's done right. You can hide stuff. That's true. That's so, true. You know, there's a there's an entire. I know. I mean, this is not too late because I'm sure you got this going where you know how to start it and all that already. But there is an entire 
ecosystem of people and groups of people and uh, communities of them, right? Uh, that deals with uh, cosplay and any of this kind of thing because uh, it's, it's like a way of life. And some of them make it into careers that I'm sure you could mine their advice and stuff like that if you ever need it, if you just look for that kind of thing. Yeah, there's a couple of things I've looked up already in some of those type of forms, mm-hmm. how, to, how to weather clothing, you know, because some of the clothing yeah. I've, I've got for him is brand new. Can't do that. It's got to be right. weathered correctly. Yes, we did talk about that off the off the yeah, yeah. yeah. So, see, so yeah, it's fun. Got a little hobby until October. Uh, I, I love it because speaking of speaking of that, I've also uh, I had a, a week off. Um, eh, reasons are not important, but I had a week off, and in that week off, I did what? I mean, I did. Uh, so I won't include the food stuff exactly because I figure that's more boring, but. Um, like, you know, like I, I made scones for the first time and I made like um, a couple of TikTok recipes just to see if they worked just for funsies. And did they? And they did work, actually. They did. One of them, not so much, not as much as the rest. But one of them in particular is kind of a, like a favorite. And of course, it's the fattiest one. But I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, but I did other stuff, other projects akin to your art project, Jay. Um, I did what I do. I did. I made my own soap. You made your own soap? Mm-hmm. Two different batches. And I made um, two different scents, obviously, other than, other than the coffee. Um, and they're blonde roast, by the way. Um, hmm. So I made them at home. You can make soap now without using lye, which lye is a very dangerous chemical. I'm thinking um, Fight Club here right now. That's, what what my, that's what my brother said. The first fucking thing he said. I'm like, I'm glad you said that. And not that I was going all Martha Stewart on you and shit. Um, because you could go either way. It's usually more of a. You know, I'm not saying it is whatever, you know, people say it's kind of frilly. I mean, I don't think so. I just wanted to see if I could do it. So anyway, I did two different batches and I included uh, coffee grounds in one. And in the other one, I put coffee beans, you know, and uh, and I tried. Yeah, right. Exactly. And, um, you know, I obviously a couple of mistakes. No big deal. It came out. I mean, it works like soap. It dried really well. It's just that maybe the ratio of coffee and things I put in there was either too much or too little. So I got to figure out a way, a way around that. But I got all the materials in advance. I got the molds and everything. Wow. And uh, yeah, I did two batches. And one of them smells like, what is it? Honey and vanilla. And the other one is like lemon. So Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. So I made that. Um, in addition to that, I have for uh, about a month or so, I've amassed little by little the materials to, I'm not done with it yet though. The materials to um, paint glass. Okay. And, uh, what I mean by paint glass, I don't mean just paint that or, or uh, uh, paint that is uh, safe for glass or that sticks the best, although that does make sense. It's more about a very specific type of paint that is translucent, meaning that like if you were to put like, um, like a candle or a light source in the glass, in the bottle, let's say, in my case, bottle, um, the paint won't obscure it like it won't shut off the light from it it will just go through it and it'll give like whatever ah. color i put in there right that kind of like shimmer through it right so it'll be red colored right or green or whatever so i bought a bunch of spray paint there are sea glass type i don't remember the name of it, sorry um and what i've been waiting, i've been wanting to do this for a few months now when i realized how much of an alcoholic i've become and i've collected all these bottles of different types of alcohol right um some more than others like i have probably have more vodka and kalua bottles <laughs> than any other one right you, you know i have a closet full of empty bourbon and whiskey bottles yeah and some would, of them are yeah. really cool bottles right so if you'd like them, that's what i was saying that some of these guys some of these bottles look badass i don't want to just throw them out i want to see if i could do something with them exactly so i started putting lights into some of them like string lights that I hook around and I even have this battery power thing on the outside that I could attach to maybe with some sort of glue or maybe add a, a Velcro thing. I haven't got the Velcro kit yet. Uh, so it could be removable easy and then have it on one side and then I painted certain shapes and diagrams. And I, I'm, I just started playing with it, but I did my first painting thing. I went to the dollar store, got a bunch of like practice glasses, you know, different shapes and yeah. just started spraying them, see what they look like and shit. Um, so yeah, I did that too. And that's been a little fun. I can't wait to do a round two on that. And I started looking into, uh, 
I got the materials for it. I haven't started it yet, though, so it doesn't count, I guess. But uh, I got the materials to make uh, it's something they put the face. It's uh, it's not moisturizer. It's the other one. Um, like some sort of scouring. Uh, it is like a scouring thing. Liquid. It's made out of coffee grounds. What's the name of it? Exfoliating. Exfoliator. Thank you. There it is. Yes, I got to. St- I saw. I saw a lot of recipes and stuff that people do online for uh, exfoliating and stuff that you could make at home. And I'm not much of an exfoliator, clearly, because I couldn't think of the name. But uh, <laughs> I just want to see if I can make it, and then maybe I'll use it then, see how cool it works, or because some of them are sugar based, some of them are whatever different types. And uh, yeah, so I, I got into that a little bit, and I, I got the materials for it. I haven't started it yet, but it looks pretty easy to make. So, You've yeah. been you were busy on your vacation. Yeah. Yep. Do I see an Oscar Specter Etsy shop in the future? Uh, I will. I will not. I will admit that it had crossed my mind. But oh, yeah. uh, first and foremost, I'm not not doing it with that in in mind necessarily. I just want to see if I can do it first, and uh, see if I like it, and obviously see what sticks. Also, because uh, you know, just trying to have fun with my time here. You know, whatever. Absolutely. Well, you know what they say: idle hands. Yes. Was a I am terrible to be movie with Seth Green. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is a terrible movie. Who else was in that movie? Seth I feel like Green, the only one the, I remember, but I don't know. He was kind of the ambiguous, handsome, blonde actor in the 90s. I can't remember the kid's name. He was in quite a few movies, but I'd give you a, a $10,000 if someone could pull that kid's name out of their ass. If watch uh, it be some huge ass star that we just, we just don't think of anymore. Or like, or, yeah. he's, or he just looks so different now, you know. Um, but yeah, that's what I've been up to over the last two weeks. It's awesome, man. Yeah. And, oh, and uh, and a side side note, I guess I finally got, and this is for not for political reasons, but I finally got my second. I'm vaccinated now, officially, my second shot, and everything. Yeah. And uh, again, the only, and the only reason I didn't or hadn't before is just because I'm lazy. <laughs> we could but, get, uh, start getting back together again, record face to face. Right. So, yeah, so I got that and uh, yeah, I felt a little bad for sure. But otherwise, it's fine. That was the other new thing, I guess. Nothing major. Everyone's done that. Or a lot of people have. Not everyone. Right. right. Um, that's a problem. Not enough. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Other than that, that's what I've been up to. Cool. Well, it sounds like we both got some good hobbies rolling. And it's uh, the, na- the guy's name is Eldon Henson. Eldon you're right. Henson. You're right. He is popular from a certain era, though, and is not from recent stuff either. Right. He's in there. Oh, right. That was the last thing I saw him in, I think, was Daredevil, the show on Netflix. He plays uh, the he was... Murdoch's, the, the lawyer friend, the other co-owner of the lawyer firm. Oh, yes. He, you're right. Okay. I know exactly who you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. He was in Idle Hands, but there was a blonde kid, too. I thought that was him. Are you sure? No, it's it's so not important. I'm almost no, positive. Jessica Alba was in it too. I didn't know that. What really? Mm, yeah. I, I almost feel like I have to watch the movie to know for sure who you're talking about, but I'm not gonna see that movie again. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um yeah, great. Should we get yeah. into the contact info? Because yes, we got a we got another heavy one tonight, so we should probably get into it. Give or take, yes. All right. Well, the easiest way to contact the supernatural occurrence studies podcast is by visiting our website, chicagoghostpodcast.com. From chicagoghostpodcast.com, you get to all of our social platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Yes, we have a YouTube channel. And of course, Patreon. For just $5 a month, in case you didn't know, you get access to a library of Patreon-only content, exclusive podcasts, video casts, cool swag, bonuses, all sorts of great stuff. So what do you say? Support your favorite podcast. Join our Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash supernatural occurrence studies podcast, or just go to the Patreon link that I left in this episode show notes. What do you say? Support your favorite show. We also have a phone number, Oscar. I don't know if we've talked about this in a while. So you should see he's gripping his face. <laughs> he's rubbing between his, his eyes. Like, you know, did you watch the new Candyman? You know that saying something like this phone number is like saying Candyman. I haven't seen it. But instead it, of invoking but... something that, that kills you, 
It's giving me a mic. So <laughs> that's why I'm holding my head this way. Um, the very na- the, just when you mention phone and number, well, are you actually saying the number yet? Yeah, it's starting to give me a migraine. That's how bad this phone number is. Sorry, but you have to I fucking gotta, say it. So I gotta do it. I gotta. I'm gonna do walk it. away for a minute while you say the phone number. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Chicago area code eight seven two five two nine zero seven six seven. That's eight seven two. Five two nine zero seven six seven. Leave us a message. Send us a text. We'll read them and play them on the show. Oscar, do you want to come, go take some aspirins? We'll take a break. Yeah, I would love that. Actually, thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll be back. Listeners, welcome back to the show. Well, the lights are turned down low. The ceremonial candle is lit. And those drinks are flowing. Let's start this show. All right. Before we begin, I just want to put a disclaimer out there. This is a part two. Mm -hmm. Please, if you haven't done so, go back and listen to episode 144, The Octopus Murders. This is a continuation of that episode, The Octopus Murders conspiracy and it's been decided that this is going to be a three-parter a trilogy a trilogy yes and i just got to give you some inside baseball here once all is said and done oscar will have close to if not over a 100 page script for this trilogy that goes to show you the level the insane level of research and dedication that goes to this show oscar thank you I can't or anxiety, wait. really, that's all it is. <laughs> Tons all of anxiety, anxiety fueled. <laughs> Tons of anxiety. I can't wait to see where this thing goes. Oscar, why don't you go ahead and take it away, man? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, so I will, um, I must implore you again. He did mention, Jay did mention, this is a part two, but I will implore you to listen or maybe even re-listen part one only because The information provided to you um, in detail can be hard to keep up in your head. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to do my best here to recap and to remind you of key details to better understand the connections that I have for you today. And then one thing that you'll see that rapidly will become apparent is how much simpler the events of the previous show are compared to this show. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. I mean, get ready for more names and events and details. However, before I get too far ahead of myself, previously on the Supernatural Occurrence Studies podcast, two cases. We begin with a triple murder in 1981 outside of Indio, California. Fred Alvarez, Ralph Boger, and Patricia Castro were killed. It's a professional hit, and it's clear that Alvarez was the target. The case remains unsolved, but conspiracy arose when people claimed that Alvarez was killed because of nefarious dealings happening at a nearby Indian reservation called Cabazon Band of Mission Indians. Alvarez was a member, and he had a few disagreements with Cabazon's financial advisor, John Philip Nichols, who was well-connected and helped make the connections for a legitimate casino and growing ties with a world-known security firm called Wackenhut. Nichols was suspected but never tried, and years after the murders, was in prison for four years for trying to get guns for hire for selfish means. Jump to the 2000s. Rachel Begley, who is Ralph Boger's daughter, starts discovering more about her father's death and the triple slayings. Through perseverance, Rachel manages to get the case reopened via a cold case unit and finds a man named Jimmy Hughes whom she thinks might be the killer. Having worked as security personnel, Hughes was fired from Cabazon Band and became an evangelical minister in Honduras and headquartered in Miami. 
Rachel confronts him on an evangelical tour in Fresno, California, where he spills and alludes to his clear involvement to getting Alvarez and her father, Boger, not to mention Castro, killed in 1981. He also boldly talks about his contract killer work in the past for the U.S. government. Hughes gets arrested, and the trial, unfortunately for Rachel, gets shut down by the district attorney, and Rachel and conspiracy theorists become disillusioned. The case is still open. Lastly, we have a possible murder in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Freelance journalist Danny Casolaro becomes an overnight sensation among news outlets and conspiracy theorists when he is found dead in his Sheraton Inn hotel room in 1991. It appears that it is suicide. Razor blade, alcohol, cigarettes, and a suicide note is left behind. Twelve slashes to both of his wrists, Danny was a driven and outgoing individual who prophesied his demise to his brother weeks beforehand. This is because of the book he was working on. He claims to have found a shadowy organization working within the halls of power in Washington and around the globe that is responsible for lots of sabotage, money, and murder. Casolero coined it the octopus. He found many connections to shady doings via two primary sources, which helped him understand how a computer company, the DOJ, and eventually the triple murders in 1981, are all connected. His death was not only untimely, but strange. Although ruled as a suicide by authorities and the FBI, Casolero's many papers on his book and documents proving what he'd found were missing from his possessions, something he never left anywhere without. Other strange details, such as his early involvement before his family was notified, also fueled conspiracy fires. Casolero's death is very much a mystery, even taken at face value. But what's more ponderous is his echoes in the decades to come as people have taken the mantle to uncover this octopus organization once and for all. All right. <clears throat> in the legal world, a conspiracy is an agreement between two or more people committing an illegal act, along with an intent to achieve the agreement's goal. Conspiracy is a funny thing because we've all done it, though usually not illegal. In grade school, for example, my brother and I would inform the other when the latest report on our schoolwork was due to be mailed so that the letter can be intercepted from one of us from parental view. <laughs> we get Fs, guess what? We tell the other brother, hey, fucking grab the fucking mailman. Two friends would devise and manipulate a conversation with someone they like to see if they, in turn, like them back, usually through subterfuge. This is obviously to avoid any kind of shame or to see if they like them before they ask them out. So the key difference between lying or playing around and conspiracy is legality. Here's some additional information on that meaning. Conspiracy generally carries a penalty of its own. In addition, Conspiracies allow for derivative, derivative liability, where conspirators can also be punished for the illegal acts carried out by other members, even if not directly involved. Thus, were one or more members of the conspiracy committed legal acts to further the conspiracy's goals, all members of the conspiracy may be held accountable for those acts. And conspiracy applies to both civil and criminal offenses. For example, you may conspire to commit murder or conspire to commit fraud. If you recall, I tease left and right about how and why these murders happened and are connected. The information provided, provided to you today can easily be dramatized, but there's really no need for me. The last show had the make and model of a murder mystery thriller with a headstrong protagonist. The information and connections on this show has the bones of a more complicated political mystery, but more of an ensemble cast than just like one hero or two heroes. Ultimately, my goal here is to instill this sense of doom. Nearly everyone I'll be talking about, which are all involved in conspiracies of their own, were not convicted for their actions. It is baffling, but especially so when you'll see how ironclad truthful some of this stuff en ends up being. And the ones that do end on the business side of the courtroom, they are most likely there through trumped up charges. 
Likewise, nearly all of the people I'll be talking about merit their own spotlight, their own think pieces and deep dives. Before I start with the first segment, I should point out that I'll be referencing back to the last show, both to refresh your memories on details of the episode and to understand its connection to the subject of the segment. I should also say that I'll be quoting from lots of places and that important names mentioned in a segment might return later as a focus. The sources I used the most to gather the information are from Sherry Seymour's book and Jim Keith and Ken Thomas's book. Again, both mentioned on the last episode who I also used for sources. And obviously it goes without saying the many articles that corroborate these books and other theories. So without further ado, let's begin with the Wackenhut Corporation. The Wackenhut Connection. To explain where, how, and what this company was all about, here's a shortened version of an outdated introduction that used to be sent to prospective clients. Quote, <clears throat> Wackenhut Corporation had its beginnings in 1954 when George R. Wackenhut and three other former special agents of the FBI formed a company in Miami, Special Agent Investigators, to provide series to business and industry. In 1962, Wackenhut operations extended from Florida to California and Hawaii. On January 1st, 1966, the company became international with offices in Caracas, Venezuela, through half ownership of an affiliate. The Wackenhut Corporation became public in 1966 with over-the-counter stock sales and joined the American Stock, stock Exchange in 1967. Hmm. Through acquisitions of subsidiaries and affiliates, now totaling more than 20, and expansion of its contracts into numerous territories and foreign countries, the Wackenhut Corporation had grown into one of the world's largest security and investigative firms, unquote. There's a lot more to this company. For example, in 1960, Wackenhut began extending its physical services to the U.S. government as a subsidiary, which prohibits said government from contracting with companies which furnish investigative or detective services. So this means it's kind of like it's kind of like visiting a bunch of divorce attorneys so that the spouse can't hire them. <laughs> you know, you know about this move in the legal world? It's like a monopoly move. You know, they would get contracts through governments and therefore other firms can't do the same with the government because they already did it, you know. In 78 and 79, Wackenhut was brought into the fields of energy management, like the nuclear industry, as well as environmental, and acquired a company specializing in outdoor electronic security. They don't work just for business and industry, though. They also take on individual clients, assuming they can afford it and have the status. By the 80s, Wackenhut had services like insurance inspectors, surveys, corporate acquisitions, pre-employment screening, background reports, polygraph examinations, and general investigations for criminal fraud and arson. Quote, the wide variety of services offered by Wackenhut Corporation also includes guard and electronic security for banks, office buildings, apartments, industrial complexes, and other physical structures training programs in English and foreign languages to apply Wackenhut procedures to individual client needs, fire, safety, and, and protective patrols, rescue and first aid services, emergency support programs tailored to labor management disputes, which sounds shady, <laughs> and pre-departure screening programs widely used by airports and airlines. The company has facilities and offices with operations spread across the U.S. and extending into Canada, the U.K., Western Europe, the Middle East, Indonesia, Central and South America, and the Caribbean, unquote. These guys sound like some shady, nah, j no, just no, some bad, yeah. shady motherfuckers, man. Already they do, right? Really it's just like it's I hate just business, it. but... Wow. Yeah. It's a lot. It's like half the world. That's right there. 
they're missing Australia and uh, Asia and Africa, I guess, but that's, that's half the world, mm, seemingly. From a source that used to work for Wackenhut via the CIA stated the following, quote, you know, they've got retired Admiral Stansfield Turner, a former CIA director, Clarence Kelly, former FBI director, Frank Carlucci, former CIA deputy director, James Rowley, former Secret Service director, Admiral Bobby Ray Inman, former acting chairman of President Bush's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, Holy and shit. former CIA deputy director. Before his appointment as Reagan's CIA director, the late K William Casey was Wackenhut's outside legal counsel. Unquote. Wow, no kidding. Yep. And I checked most of these names, not all of them because I have a life. I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. And I checked the, you know, the list and their backgrounds. And it's, it's true. Their ties to Wackenhut is true on them. Yeah. What do you think of that so far? <laughs> heavy, heavy hitters. Yeah. And they all have their own here. dossiers and shit. They all have their own, all these names, big wigs in their own fields. I mean, a lot the of these guys, basically, they're spooks. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> So would you say, and I hope I'm not giving away a lead here or or anything, but is is Wackenhut considered the octopus? I see what you mean. No. Okay. Okay. No. And uh, the reason for that is simple is that um, there's a lot of people that have, I don't want to say nothing to do with them, but definitely that do not work for them or do not hold stock with them that are involved in the octopus but are not connected in that way. Maybe they used them before as a service, things like that, mm. but like not, not quite so, no. It's, okay. definitely, it's definitely bigger than them, the octopus, I guess. But it's, it's not like their headquarters. It's some whack and hut office, at least not that I would imagine. Got it. Okay. Right. Okay. And that's not going ahead. I mean, I actually don't know the answer quite yet to that, but based on everything I read, I would say no. Okay, fair enough. So audience out there, listeners, what do you think of this company so far? Is it great business, nothing more, or does it immediately sound sinister or potentially sinister? Let's talk about what makes Wagon Hut darker, and I'll begin with an analogy. In television, especially in the 2000s, the first few episodes, more so the pilot, establishes what the show will look like for its duration, be it 20 seasons or three more episodes. It is how a singular vision get, best gets recopied or fortified as the show progresses. It is why Martin Scorsese directed the pilot for Boardwalk Empire, why David Fincher did Mindhunter, and why Brian Singer did House, and so on, so on. In more than a way, it establishes their stamp of style and direction for the rest of the show, even if they never look at it again. That being said, George R. Wackenhut was anti-Semitic and extremely right-wing. These character traits establish what Wackenhut turned into after he retired and passed. Several articles have been written about, have been written concerning this nature within the bones of Wackenhut, and one in the 90s gets into it very well, actually. They begin citing the crazy contract Wackenhut has had, like being the CIA's backup working for the Pentagon, the FBI, guarding the nuclear reactors and, and Alaskan oil pipelines, secretly arming Iraq and fueling unrest in Venezuela and saying that it sounds like a spy thriller novel, but it's all true. In the mid-1960s, Wackenhut boasted to potential investors that they had files on 2.5 million Americans. Under the fire, like other terrible people, of locating left-leaning communists, meaning subversives and sympathizers, 2.5 million. They would sell this information as needed. Much of this came forward under a former staff member of the House Committee on Un-American Activities, Carl Barslag, when his private file was taken. The reason Wackenhut is first on my to-do list is because it's connected to the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians. We heavily talked about on the last show. It was told in the press and other places that Wackenhut hooked up with Cabazon Indians to manufacture arms and sending them to all sorts of places. You might ask, why does the Disney of security firms want with some small reservation in California? 
The simplest reason is this. Indian reservations are sovereign land and do not come under federal jurisdiction. Because of this, Wackenhut had to form a partnership, a joint business venture with Cabazon Indians in order to legally produce high-tech arms and explosives and be able to send them worldwide. You see, only the U.S. government has or can lend the green light to manufacture weapons on U.S. soil. This was how Wackenhut was able to sidestep that while achieving maximum profits. Brilliant. This way, yep. This way, Wackenhut can also avoid congressional prohibitions that would have turned up if they weren't using reservation land. This explains how it was possible to ship weapons to the Contras and Middle Eastern countries. For example, what do you think of that so far? <laughs> Brilliant play. I mean, Brilliant yeah, play by Wackenhut. These are not stupid people. Right. And you see tons of examples in our day-to-day, -day, in our modern history, right? Like modern events, companies doing this shit all the time to save them, right? They fuck some people over for to save X million, three billion there, yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So not out of the reach of possibility here. No. Right. So let's dig a little deeper and, you know, name some names here. Quote, in the early 1980s, Dr. John Nichols, the Cabazon tribal administrator, obtained the Department of Defense secret facility clearance for the reservation to conduct various research projects. Nichols then approached Wackenhut with an elaborate joint venture proposal to manufacture 9mm machine pistols, laser-sighted assault weapons, sniper rifles, and portable rocket systems on the Cabazon Reservation and in Latin America. At one point, he even sought to develop biological weapons. Unquote. What the fuck? Mm -hmm. Supposedly, this was done on one square mile of land on the reservation. No more, no less. For some reason, they, they really pointed that out. From here, John Philip Nichols, the man I mentioned on the last show that was into some shady things, including getting arrested for trying to hire someone to kill for money, drafted a plan to provide security for a palace. This was Crown Princess Fahd's palace in Tiaf, Saudi Arabia. And it is safe to say that, that once the Crown Princess people looked into Cabazon Indians and Wackenhut, their assurances that any Jewish interference or sabotage was unlikely, given the company's history, meaning their right-wing anti-Semitic history. Okay. Therefore, they accepted. The reason, the reasoning behind backing certain South American regimes and Middle Eastern royals is broad but powerful to dissuade communist-leaning influences, particularly from Russia, of course. Mm. As we know, George Wackenhut's company and ideals were simpatico with anti-communism. Plus, the very fact that the U.S. was very much like this back then, and mm. still to more than one degree today. You know, it kind of fits a little too nicely. Think of the McCarthy era, people, is what I'm saying. This leads to a myriad of connections of people and institutions that at times has a looser grip and other times a firmer one. This kind of global business acumen leads Wackenhut and key players to get in bed with the Reagans, Bush, Nixon, and other foreign dignitaries and agendas. But I digress for now. Let's connect more with Cabazon. The four key figures in the Wackenhut Cabazon partnership are John Philip Nichols, Michael Riconosciuto, Peter Zokowski, and Robert Fry. Now, John Philip Nichols has had enough airtime on the show with this one and the last one. And I call him like a shadow man, the man behind the scene. For all the name drops he's had since the 80s, and as powerful as his connections were, Nichols has no wiki page. For example, you know, you think there would be by now, but no. Nearly everything about him is told through others and in business dealings. What I find fascinating about Nichols, and I'll pose it as a question for you, is was John Philip Nichols working for Wackenhut first and foremost, or the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians? What do you think? Well, I mean, I'm just going chronologically how the episode played out. I would say the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians. 
That's actually first. good because I, I, I I'm, I'm with you on that. Yeah, but Shadow Man, that's a great uh, moniker for him because I could tell you, trying to put the episode show notes together for episode 144, it was fucking impossible. I finally found it, but so hard to find a picture of this man. Right. So hard. Right. Yeah. Um, it's another prominent guy. I'm going to focus on later on here. It's a little teasier, but uh, I only saw one and it's like an older one and it looks more like a sketch than a picture. And I don't know, maybe you can find a better one than I did. Yeah. No, I'm just, uh, I agree with you. Shadow man. Great. Yeah. 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 Now, if you recall Nichols's family, entire family, worked on the reservation, his son and his wife. But Nichols Sr. came into Cabazon a veteran at making deals, and like I said on the last show, kicking ass. He's the person that began the venture of Cabazon and Wackenhut, even if he didn't run it. The whole time, his position was officially set to administrator for the reservation. Here's a little more on Nichols. Quote, police reports indicate that Nichols previously did business in Saudi Arabia South Africa, Panama, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Mexico, Chile, Brazil, the Netherlands, England, Canada, France, Spain, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. In 1960, Nichols became the manager of a Coca-Cola bottling plant in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Then he became a Pentecostal leader of the Chilean Pentecostal movement and attended several evangelical and gospel congresses in Bolivia. When Nichols was hired in 1978, oh my God. he wrote himself a 10-year contract with the Cabazon tribe that gave him 50% of the profits of any business he brought to the reservation. In the summer of 1980 and during the next three years, Nichols embarked on a series of international security and military ventures to provide security for Crown Princess Fahd's Saudi Arabia palace. Proposals to manufacture one, uh, 120 millimeter combustible cartridge cases on the reservation and in, Lat- and in Latin America, along with nine millimeter machine pistols, laser sighted assault weapons, of course, sniper rifles and the rocket systems I mentioned earlier, unquote. It's, That's Nichols. What's interesting is 80% of the uh, locations you named where he had done business is just a, a hotbed of political turmoil. Yeah, definitely. Uh, especially around that time. Around that. Yeah. A, a lot of that around that time. And some of that stuff right are like echoes spots. from previous wars, too. You think of that? Yeah. Yeah. Like the Korean War, things like that. Um, yeah. This guy. It's all intentional. It's all connecting a little here. Now, we're going to move on to another of the four key players that I mentioned uh, a paragraph or two ago. <laughs> Robert Fry was vice president uh, for Wacken Hut's operations in Indio, California. I don't have much on Fry because I decided not to research him. Time, you know, it's fucking crazy. But he was a big deal in Wacken Hut. He was in charge of Wacken Hut's international subsidiary via Cabazon Arms to securely send weapons across international lines. He was also involved in negotiations to buy the Valley Field Chemical Productions Corporations corporations of Quebec. His time working in, in Indio, the same headquarters as Cabazon Bands, by the way, began shortly before the venture was formalized in April 1st, 1981, until he suffered a heart attack and the venture was terminated on October 1st, 1984. That is the lifespan of this endeavor from 81 to 84. Robert Fry also has no wiki page. Now, Peter Zakowski, moving on, sorry, should have said moving on. Now, Peter Zakowski was the president of his Cabazon operation through Wackenhut. The following comes from a 2010 article through Associated Press writers that talk about the Fred Alvarez murder back in 81. Quote, <clears throat> Authorities probing Alvarez's death recently took a large cardboard box of Wacken Hut related documents and tape recordings from Peter Zukowski, the former president of a nearby munitions manufacturing plant. With all the documents and memos I have seen go back and forth, it looks like they wanted to do these things. It just never happened. 
Zokowski, who had government security clearance and whose wife was Indio's mayor, said Wackenhut had asked him to write a proposal to build an arsenal and manufacture tank ammunition on tribal land. But the classified project went nowhere. It was submitted. I didn't hear anything more about it. And Wackenhut withdrew, withdrew, said Zokowski, who is now 83, back in 2010. So, you know, do the math. I think they were dissatisfied with the structure of the Indian organization. The Florida-based company did sign a joint venture with the tribe to win government security contracts, but the partnership fizzled when it failed to get bids, said former Wackenhut spokesman Patrick Cannon. He said to his knowledge the deal did not involve weapons. Yet two men said in separate legal filings, the Cabazon Wackenhut partnership was forged to sell weapons to the Contras. The idea was to develop night vision goggles, machine guns, and biological and chemical weapons to support foreign entities, which included the Contras, according to an affidavit filed in an unrelated case by, by a man named Michael Rikunoshudo, who said he worked on this, on this very deal. He is now in federal prison on drug charges. People claiming CIA ties wanted the venture to develop machine guns at a top secret tribal facility for distribution to Nicaragua, said a second man, weapons manufacturer Robert Booth Nichols, who is in no relation to John Philip Nichols. In civil court filings, he said he pulled out because Wackenhut didn't provide State Department approval, unquote. Uh, There's a lot there. There is. Yeah, there really is. Anything you want to unpack there? For a minute. <laughs> that was from the article. I'm sorry, they were quoting within the code, so I don't know if I should say quote again. I'll never go with no, it's okay. dialogue. It's okay. Mm-hmm. So, so drop some names here. Yeah. Rick and Oshudo. Okay. I, like yeah, I think you put in your sandwich. Yeah. Uh yeah. I, I don't I don't know what to unpack yet. Right. You're there. right. You're right. And some of this stuff is purposefully being funny. Like I will discuss more of it, of course. But like, um, yeah, I had to put it in there. And this is where they mentioned more of a Zukowski in it and, you know, the files he was asked for and what people said that he lied about. I mean, what Patrick Cannon, the spokesman for Wacken, had said about, you know, all these dealings failed, the bits failed, no weapons were involved. But if that was a purpose to begin with, why would you? But other people are saying bullshit. Right. Two other people. Exactly. Anyway. Uh, wow. All right. Let's go on to this guy. Michael Wiganashuto. The yeah. fourth, yeah, the fourth player in the Wackenhut Cabazon partnership is a different breed altogether. He worked for the CIA when recruited to work for Wackenhut. After the venture was born, Rikunoshudo was brought in to figure out the science and technical knowledge required to actually build the weapons. This is the kind of brilliance that government agencies uh, recruit out of school, which he was. Rikuno Shudo worked at Cabazon Arms from 83 to 84 as head of research. He excelled at manufacturing fuel-to-air explosives on the reservation, which were then sent abroad, as well as modifying a borrowed version of a special software for international use. His role in the Cabazon Wackenhut partnership is heavy, but his role in the Octopus organization is more extensive. You see, he is my linchpin. He ties Cabazon Indians with with Danny Casalero's research. He is the glue that ties both cases from the last show together because of what he told and showed Casalero possibly led to his death in that hotel bathtub. Rikuno Shudo's profile and exploits will be told in parts as he fits within the episode later on. And now, this might be the best time to mention that Danny Casalero, the freelance journalist found dead in West Virginia in 1991, had mentioned to colleagues that his next destination was to be Indio, California. Casalero's research through Michael Wiccanosciuto, of course, led him to find out what happened at Cabazon Indio Reservation and was beginning to plan on going there before he died, like the beginnings of the plan, right? This, unfortunately, cannot be proven as it was word of mouth. Another interesting tidbit I found is that Kessler was noodling to title his book Indio based on everything that went on in there, presumably. 
there's really a whole lot more, but I kind of have to move on. I went with Back and Hut as my first me- segment because it nicely sets the rest of the show and it encourages further research for those wanting to know more. If you are inclined to know more and what Whack and Hut is up to these days, search for G4S Secure Solutions. That is their current name as of 2002, as part of a merger, I think. I'm going to have to look that up. Yeah. So that's the first one. Okay. So do we think... What do you think? I'm not going to say yes or no. It was, do, do we think Rick and Asciutto, Rick, Rick and Asciutto was uh, mm-hmm. the man Casolero was meeting up with? Yes. Really? Yes. yes. Sorry, I thought I didn't say that that way. But yeah, it's um, I believe I mentioned it. I might have even mentioned it in the last show that that was him. Or maybe I just had two sources. But either way, yeah, he's one of the two sources. Mm-hmm. So was this the one that the waitress said? Oh, yeah, I, oh. we saw... We saw no, that's something else. I know what you're. I know what you're talking about. No, the, no, no. The dark complected man. Yeah, no, 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 no. Oh, okay. That's something else. Sorry, don't get. Definitely don't confuse that one. Um, I guess uh, I'll just tell you this part now because I'm not. I don't mention it ever in this one. It's in part three. <laughs> gotcha. Well, we can hold it till part three. Yeah. yeah. But no, that has nothing to do with it. I mean, it has everything to do with this, but in a smaller thing. It's not the same guy. No. Um, because uh, I mean. Yeah, but Michael Wickenshooter Michael, Michael, and one other person are um, the two sources that Na- Danny Castillo, you know, got the fountain, the grand majority of his information that led him to, like, talk to other people, phone call a lot of people, possibly led him to be noticed by someone shady, got him killed, ideally, if you believe that he didn't uh, commit suicide, of course. Right. This is all speculated in the last show, of course, but it's good to remind him. Um, yeah, and that's where, like, you know, led to his death in the sense that he got too much and he had, he was just one man, you know. So if you want him killed, you get him killed. Wow. Right. Then the papers that were stolen or that were not in still, still missing the hotel room, do you think those papers were provided by Rick and Nishudo? Definitely. Wow. Or at least, like, just like where to find them. <sighs> okay. Yeah. I have real stuff on that too. Um, all right. Let's move on to the next segment here called the Inslaw Affair. Inslaw. Kind of like coleslaw, but in. Inslaw Affair. Inslaw. Mm-hmm. Okay. Inslaw yeah. Affair. Now, this whole thing is a doozy. The reasons I want to tell you about Inslaw are many. It's super fascinating, and it was labeled the scandal that wouldn't die. Inslaw brings in the government in a much bigger way than anything I've said today or on the last show combined. Nearly everything about this segment is corroborated with documents like affidavits, internal reporting, and courtroom files that turn into articles and books down to me. Another reason is that introduces Danny Casalero's other big-time source of information. If you were to look at this from a judicial standpoint, the foreground is the case of Anslaw versus the U.S. Department of Justice, and the background is what those documents never say, but show that intent, like motive, for example, and financially gainful plotting are rarely, if ever, in stuffy documents. But that's our foreground. It's what makes it interesting for people like us who are wanting to know the whole truth, not just a part of it. Like most things in life, if you want to know what makes Inslaw interesting, we got to get into the background first. Inslaw is an acronym that stands for Institute for Law and Social Research. Inslaw was an information technology company that was based in Washington, D.C. Its founder is a man named William A. Hamilton, who began Inslaw as a nonprofit organization in 1973. Their contracts and grants prim- primarily came from the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, or the LEAA. This is the government, so acronyms here folks sorry they love it they love mm-hmm. them they, they really fucking do inslaw's purpose was to develop case management software for law enforcement office automation specifically inslaw developed a program called promise which stands for prosecutors management information system and it was meant for use in law enforcement record keeping 
and case monitoring activities. This was the 70s, folks. So all of the convenience we can appreciate today took a painstakingly long time back then, especially when paperwork is involved. The option to drag and drop was non-existent. So this software at this time sounds boring to us, but saves a lot of time for them. Let's not forget, time equals money. So saves time, saves money. In 1980, Inslaw continued operating, but as a for-profit and began marketing the software to current and new users. This was because Congress abolished the LEAA in 1980, which led Bill Hamilton to transfer Inslaw's assets over to the new corporation. So that's how he became the way he did. But I'm not a computer guy, all right? I never saw Halton catch fire, and I know the movie Hackers is fake as fuck, so I will not go into detail of the software. The transferring process from mainframe to 16-bit mini computer versions, for example, like I don't know if I could get into it because it'll be boring and I won't understand the information. One thing that I will say is that in order for Promise to work in different systems or with alterations that seem benign in 2021, like languages or menus, one would have to develop it each separate time, customized for the one buying it. System updates and operating systems are kind of like that a little bit. Now, before I drop the scandal hammer, I want to talk about a contract and some of the rights that Promise used to have. Now, written in COBOL, COBOL is, um, they call it a... Programming language. Programming language, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Old bastard. It's really uh, old. Yeah, 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 right. So I, I could tell it's all because I've never heard of it before, this research. Written in COBOL, the software's primary users of the first few versions of Promise for state and local law enforcement, as well as the U.S. Attorney's Office of the District of Columbia. All of this came under contracts when the LEAA was still around and INSLAW was a nonprofit. In litigation, both the DOJ and INSLAW agreed that those versions of Promise are in the public domain and neither entities have exclusive rights to it. Anytime after 1980 is where the problem begins. The pilot program, I'm sorry, the pilot project for Promise began in 1979, but the Department of Justice were loving the results and so decided for full implementation of the software in 81. This was to be Promise in, in 20 of the largest U.S. Attorney, attorney's offices and 74 in smaller ones with word processor and mini computer versions. In March of 82, Insla was awarded a three-year, $10 million contract by the contact division, the Executive Office of United States Attorneys, or EOUSA. Sort of got it. <sighs> Sorry. Things began to fall apart right away. EOUSA and DOJ were not happy. They determined that Insla was violating terms of an advance payment clause in the contract, which Insla needed to literally finance the project. This part alone became months of negotiations. In the first year of the contract, the DOJ did not have the hardware to support Promise. Insla provided a stopgap measure, which I won't go into, until the proper equipment was installed, but the EOUSA claimed they were being overcharged for the service and withheld payments. In the second year of the contract, the DOJ claimed that there was difficulty getting Promise to work, and in 1984, they canceled a portion of the contract. This ultimately led Inslaw's financial problems to worsen, and the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in February 1985. Then, there are proprietary rights disputes in addition to all this. It's long, but I'm going to try to summarize it as best as I can. And yes, it is all very important, and it connects to some dark shit, okay? We know that everything created under the LEAA is public domain. What the EOUSA wanted was to have unlimited rights to all versions of promise under contract, including the versions of promise written for the stopgap measure, uh, measure I mentioned earlier. By 1982... Insla was trying to find ways to make money with Promise, 
and had made something called Enhanced Promise or Promise 82, like an update filled with, uh, you know, with all the updates and all the stuff that we're trying to maximize. The DOJ was disputing that the contract data clause said or possibly alluded to, quote, gave the government unlimited rights in any technical data and computer software delivered on the contract, unquote. This thing was supposedly resolved after the DOJ was assured and convinced by NSAW that Promise 82 contained enhancements undertaken at private expense after the cessation of the LEAA. This, uh, so I'm gonna stop right there for a second and explain a little bit because I'm realizing that it might be complicated because I read all this and look. Um, so the reason, and a company like Gensaw in this case, from, from turning nonprofit to for-profit and gaining this contract and then having problems with this contract of $10 million, $10 million with withheld payments, you know, has to try to think of the future and try to sell this thing to prospective people. So they updated it, make differences, make menus, um, prioritize certain things in it to make the software run better on different systems. Everything they did after 1980 and aside from the contracts, they were trying to do in order to sell it to other things like companies or people, individuals, right? And the DOJ were claiming that that was all theirs. Think of it that way, okay. that this was all under them. And that um, other than the public domain stuff, that they should get everything. Unlimited rights, they said. They said it twice. I said it twice for them. So, like, that is the dispute going on right now. And hopefully the rest comes as clear as I try to say it. Um, anyway, this issue be uh, came up again in 1982 when the DOJ involved its contract rights to request all the promise program and documentation. The DOJ said in litigation that the reason for this was that Insaw did not look financially reliable to continue, which is funny to me since it was them that kept having problems with the software and continually withheld payments, which they needed to fucking do it. Insaw responded in 83 that it was willing to give them the computer tapes and documents of promise, but before doing so, told the DOJ that they would have to reach an agreement on the inclusion or exclusion of the features, the changes, basically. Quote, the DOJ response to Enslaw was to emphasize that the implementation contract called for a version of promise in which the government had unlimited rights and to ask for information about the enhancements Enslaw claimed as proprietary. Enslaw agreed to provide this information, but noted that it would be difficult to remove the enhancements from the time-sharing versions of Promise and offer to provide the VAX version of Promise if the DOJ would agree to limit their distribution. In March of 1983, the DOJ again informed INSLAW that the implementation contract required INSLAW to provide, I'm sorry, to produce software in which the government had unlimited rights and that delivery of software with restrictions would not satisfy the contract, unquote. The dispute continued a little more, but that's the contract and rights issue involving promise. What do you think is happening so far? Okay. What it sounds like is the, the DOJ, the Department of Justice, is trying to get a hold of a potentially super software um, and have access to all implementations of this software. And I'm I'm guessing I don't know what Promise does, but I'm guessing it's a database of of names, whether it's, I mean, we're talking about the DOJ, so whether it's a list of criminals, a, li a list of uh, suspects, yeah, you're, you're prisoners. On, you're, you're on the right track. It's more boring than that. It's just a software that helps people track any kind of like law enforcement type of activities, which you would, which you would be right, from okay. associates of a criminal to names and dates of all the police uh, uh, workers that work in the building to like... Um, even like inventory things like how many cots are in this jail or how many guns they have and bullets and shoelaces, things like that. It's boring sounding stuff, but all itemized in one stuff in one program. Yeah. Uh, potentially incredibly important information to mm -hmm. the right entity. I would right. assume you may not care about this County, but you might care about this other one. Right. right. So with the DOJ one in possession, I, I equate possession to access. Mm -hmm. uh, they could access database anywhere the software is implemented. Yeah. 
is um, kind of what I'm getting out of this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're definitely making leaps to that that I'm going to get there. Yes, um, but yeah, I mean, it's obvious. We're a conspiracy show. Obviously, it's easy to go there. Um, yeah, that's so the this, first place I went. Yeah. I, I'm right. I'm trying to show the the first few steps of how they're trying to take it away from Insta. Okay, like one way or another, you know, they're they're doing it. They're saying things like, like for example, like the contradiction of like they're not happy with this. They're going to withhold some payments. Well, the guys can't install these things and these services or they can't help you without getting paid. Right. Right. So the and then saying that they're not financially stable, so we should get all the rights. Like, well, we're not financially stable because you won't pay us for the thing that you hired us for. And the contract states this is that. Otherwise, we should get it all back. But they're like, no, no, no. We need to do all this on limited rights. Where's the tapes? Where's the... See what I'm saying? Like Big brother. Yep. Big it's brother really, trying it's to... Bully, it's bully behavior. Yeah. You give the bully the company. lunch money... And he's still going to beat you up, you know, run the company to the ground mm -hmm. yeah. in litigation. OK, I'm yeah. following. Good. Yeah, good. Uh, continuing on here. This is where I'm going to introduce a new name. DOJ contracting officer Peter Videnix, who sent a letter proposing a modification in the contract for Enslaw. Trying to shorten it here, it basically said in return for Enslaw sending the software and data request, the DOJ would agree to not disclose or dilute the material beyond the 94 offices where promise had been already implemented. This was called modification 12. And Inslaw agreed and sent the necessary materials. All does not go well. Again, when Inslaw has problems demonstrating the extent of the enhancements and use of private funding in their development. Inslaw proposed many methods to do this but were rejected by the DOJ. So guess what happened? After filing for Chapter 11, Insla was still in dispute with the DOJ over contract payments and therefore was, were listed as a creditor. Simultaneously, the DOJ continued its office automation program and added promise to 23 more offices. Quote, when Insla learned of the installations, it notified EOUSA that this was in violation of Modification 12 and filed a claim for $2.9 million, which Inslaw said was the license fees for the software that DOJ self-installed. Inslaw also filed claims for services performed during the contract for a total of $4.1 million. The DOJ contracting officer, Peter Vindenix, denied all of these claims, unquote. Yes, this further proves what you were saying. And the naked shamelessness, really, of it all. Yeah. That they did it this way. I mean, there's more to it, of course, I'm going to say. But, like, I'm already frustrated for them. Insanely. This must have been a horrible time for them. Especially for Hamilton. <laughs> right. But, um, yeah. This is the kind of shit that seems, like, boring, but also, like, must happen all the time. Somewhere out there, feels like. Anyway. <clears throat> Now, Insla did fight back. They did appeal the denied claims to the Department of Transportation Board of Contact Appeals, or DOTBCA. <laughs> As for the rights claim, in June of 86, 1986, Insla filed an adversary hearing in bankruptcy court saying that the DOJ's actions violated provisions of the bankruptcy code by meddling with the Insla's rights, meaning that the DOJ were trying to bankrupt Insla to take promise without mm -hmm. adhering to contracts or paying them. Yep. Insla claims that the DOJ official officials like Peter Vindnix were biased against them. William Hamilton, founder of Insla, claimed that some of that bias was directed at him personally. I should mention that once the company became for profit, the owners became William Hamilton and his wife as well, Nancy Hamilton. So they were co-owners. It's nice. Couple. Now, they had mild wins or positives with an independent handling and adversary proceedings when the judge clearly stated that the people from the DOJ were being unfair and biased and unreliable. But this didn't help much when things got overturned after a judge a series of judge reappointments muddled the case in May of 1991, and they dismissed Inslaw's complaints. 
Insla appealed a decision to the Supreme Court, which, of course, declined to hear the case. I could keep going on, as I said. This is the scandal that wouldn't die. But what does that have to do with the octopus conspiracy? Well, let's see. Some of you may have figured it out, but Promise was being used by more than the DOJ and their offices. It was illegal or shady enough to bankrupt this company for selfish purposes, but to then involve the FBI, the CIA mainly, and other agents in distributing Promise at will is worse. There were several federal investigations based on what Insta claimed the DOJ was doing. This was done at first through the House Judiciary Committee, as well as Senate's Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, or PSI. This is what the Congress Congressional Investigation looked like through PSI. Through the Senate, Bill Hamilton brought new allegations, and they seem far-fetched, though plausible. He said that the DOJ's dispute with Insla was part of a conspiracy to drive them into bankruptcy so that a man named Earl W. Bryan could get the assets, including promise. Earl Bryan, in my opinion, is a player in the octopus scheme. Bryan was the founder of a venture, cap venture capital firm called Biotech, which turned into Infotechnology. Biotech Capital Corporation in the 80s controlled a company called Hadron Inc. In 1983, while Ronald Reagan was in office, Earl Bryan made an offer to Bill Hamilton to acquire Insla and his assets. Hamilton, of course, declined, and he says that Bryan threatened him, saying there are other ways of making you sell. Wow. Mm -hmm. You see, Bryan had many government contracts, and a deposition in conjunction with, with this Senate investigation, Brian testified that Hadron had roughly 40 computer system contracts with U.S. intelligence agencies and the DOJ as well. Furthermore, he was good friends with, at the time, Attorney General Edwin Meese, who actually worked for Brian in the cabinet of former California Governor Ronald Reagan and later in Reagan's White House. Wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, talk about conspiracy. Yeah. Earl Bryan began by serving in the Army Medical Corps in Vietnam before serving for Reagan in California, then had an unsuccessful run for the Senate in 74. Now, the 80s is where his business career takes him. Biotech Capital invested in companies developing medical technology, and when biotech turned into info technology, the focus became news and information services acquiring, for example, United Press International in 1988, one of the two major American newswires of its day. Funny enough, Brian filed for bankruptcy in 1991 and in 1995 was charged with conspiracy and fraud for inflating the value of his assets in an attempt to secure loans to shore up the companies. In 1996, he was sentenced to four years in prison and has since died. Last November, actually, 2020. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. His name will turn up here and there, but it is telling how behaviors from some of these companies and people are first seen suspiciously when it matters, then get caught for something just like it years later after they've been exonerated from their octopus conspiracy. Funny how that works. The way Brian's story ends, meaning going to jail for being a dick, is similar to John Philip Nichols for trying to hire a hitman and was put in jail for it. Of course, this was after the damage was done and justice was not found. Now, let's get back to Insta here. So those were the new allegations. And unfortunately, the Senate investigation produced no evidence to support further inquiry. Through the House Judiciary Committee, another investigation began, this time with completely different allegations. Insla had amassed statements and affidavits from witnesses that supported Hamilton's claims of biases and conspiracy. The two key witnesses were Ari Ben Menashe. I might be mispronouncing that, by the way. Uh, it's Israeli, the name, just saying. Ari Ben Menashe and Michael Rikunoshiro. Mm. Mm -hmm. And both of their accounts supported each other's claims. 
Rikuno Shudo swore that Earl Bryan had given him a copy of Promise 8, which says that Bryan was after Insos products. Rikuno Shudo added modifications to the software, but not menus or not menus or like things like that. He was changing Promise for use by intelligence agencies and law enforcement worldwide. This is the program that Rikuno Shudo had been working on while on Cabin Sun Indian land back in 83. The timeline fits very well too, seeing how Brian wanted to sell this software worldwide along with the DOJ fuckery that they were doing to Inslaw. Ari Ben Menashe said that the public and enhanced version of Promise were taken and sold to Israel. Quote, committee investigators interviewed Ben Menashe in May 1991 and he told them that Brian sold enhanced promise to both Israeli intelligence and Singapore's armed forces, receiving several million dollars in payment. He also testified that Brian sold public domain versions to Iraq and Jordan, unquote. As you may expect, the House Judiciary Committee found no evidence to support these claims, but they did say this of the DOJ, quote, this clearly raises the specter that the department actions against Inslaw in this matter represent an abuse of power of shameful proportions, unquote. They also used words like trickery, fraud, and deceit to describe the actions against Inslaw. A BUA report also yielded no positive results, despite Inslaw's attempts to refute, refute this. The BUA report is interesting, and if this conspiracy wasn't so lengthy already, I might have tackled it, but I do recommend it as further reading material. How do you say that again? What report? BUA. B-U-A. It's based on the guy who did it, but it's like a big deal. For some reason, they kept calling it the BUA report. So okay. Okay. I just named it the same. I didn't read too much into it, but anything uh, you want to <laughs> mention there? No, I hate to say it. No, I think I'm okay. Yeah. Is it too Still, much? It's a lot. I'm, I'm following though. I'm following. Yeah. But you're starting to see, right? This we're gonna shoot at this Indian and slow. Yeah. It's far okay. reaching for mm-hmm. sure. Yes. <clears throat> Notice how May of 1991 is when Ben Menashe gives his testimony a few months before Danny Castellaro's death. You see, through Rico no Shudo, Ari Ben Menashe had met with Castellaro for his octopus book, and they had allegedly met a day or two before he died in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Uh-huh. I believe it was mentioned in the Unsolved Mysteries clip from the last show. Same thing goes for Rico Noshudo. He testified sometime in late 1990 to early 91 and was Castellaro's source for the many forks and branches of the octopus conspiracy. They were in constant contact. Going back to Insta here, there's a couple of things I want to mention that thickens the plot. See that? I tease you and then I go back to the topic. So, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> now, this following section comes from Cherry Seymour's book. <clears throat> Quote, in May 1988, just a few months after the federal bankruptcy court in Washington, D.C. issued fully litigated findings that the Justice Department had stolen the promised legal case management software from Inslaw in the early 80s through trickery, fraud, and deceit, and then attempted to drive Inslaw out of business so the company would be unable to litigate, Ronald Legrand, the chief investigator for the state Senate Judiciary Committee, telephoned Hamilton to pass on information from someone he described as a trusted senior Justice Department career official who had been in the criminal division of the Justice Department since the time of the Watergate scandal under Nixon. Hamilton had recently explained to Legrand his belief that the Reagan administration had stolen promise with the intention of using the stolen software as the basis for the award of a massive Justice Department computerization contract to a friend of the Reagan administration. Mm -hmm. Legrand told Hamilton that that his source had asked him to tell Mr. and Mrs. Hamilton the following, quote within the quote, what you... What you think happened did happen. You are not crazy, but you do not know squat about how dirty the Inslaw case really is. If you ever learn even half of it, you will be sickened. Inslaw is a lot dirtier for the the Department of Justice and its breadth and depth. 
than Watergate. The Justice Department has been compromised at every level on the Inslaw case. Unquote, both ends. It's okay. <laughs> but someone's just saying this, right? So at face value, do we take it? I don't know. Probably. What do you think? <clears throat> do you think? So I apologize for the long ass fucking sentence. Um, yeah. So look what the DOJ did to Inslaw. I mean, mm-hmm. Corruption at every level, probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm about to get into this trusted senior official that I just hyped up through the quote. But uh, yeah, to say things like that, that bigger than Watergate. I mean, Water. I mean, Watergate, I know for people like us, Jay, I mean, our age, we know what Watergate is. Although I think a lot of people my age maybe don't know. I don't know. But uh, it's a huge thing, for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. A huge American thing. It's like brought, a, brought down Nixon. Yeah, I mean, r- right. Let him crying and running away in a helicopter. Um, I love watching that clip, by the way, when he goes in the helicopter. Um, okay, <clears throat> continuing on here. That trusted senior Justice Department official was none other than Elliot Richardson. You know who this guy is? I don't recognize the name. Okay, here's some modern history for you. He's the kind of politician, it feels anyway to me, that we need more of. He was a lawyer and public servant who is most famous for two things. His involvement in the Inslaw case, defending Bill Hamilton, as well as was featured in the Dad and Casalero episode of the Unsolved Mysteries clip that I used. And he was also attorney, U.S. Attorney General. Now, he was a prominent figure in the Watergate scandal and resigned rather than obey Nixon's order to fire the special prosecutor that was on the case. That's the second thing he's famous for. I should probably say that's the first thing. And the second thing was the other one. Wow. Okay. So he's like a good guy, I would say. Along with Attorney General, he also held three additional prominent positions. Secretary of Health, Commerce, and Defense. One of two people in U.S. history to have held four cabinet positions. Jeez. Mm-hmm. Richardson did a lot to help Hamilton, like writing letter- letters and propositions to get traction on further investigations and the fact that his support carried a lot of weight in Washington. Now, one strange roadblock he encountered was when was when then Attorney General Richard Thornburg was stonewalling Richardson's letters, imploring the need for further investigation on the actions that were taken against Inslaw. This was shortly before 91, before testimonies by Rick Nishudo and Ben Menashe were taken, and Richardson had told Thornburg, Thornburg that it was his duty to investigate these claims because they had merit. So he filed a lawsuit against Thornburg in federal district court for failing and refusing to carry out his clear duty in the Enslaw case, but that the ruling stated that the discretion of this decision is up to the prosecution as to whether or not it wants to investigate and that there was no legal authority to intrude. Once those affidavits claiming the promise since the early 80s were used for various intelligence tracking applications, Richardson sought outside counsel. Mm -hmm. This is the first time I'm mentioning this part. Richardson asked a retired four-star general, Admiral Daniel Murphy, to review the plausibility of the claims that covert dispersal of promise were used for intelligence applications, and if he could help explain Attorney General Thurnberg's otherwise inexplicable failure to enforce the federal criminal laws. The Admiral, this Admiral Murphy had served as Richardson's military advisor when he was Secretary of Defense under Nixon, and later had held two of the top posts in the U.S. intelligence, which are Deputy Director of the CIA under President Ford, and Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence under Carter, President Carter, sorry. A reliable expert, basically. I mean, this is a reliable guy, right? Absolutely. I would say so. I'm going to read the last part of a chapter in Seymour's book that makes him makes this better and simultaneously worse. <laughs> You'll see what I mean. Quote <clears throat> After reading the affidavits and the install lawsuit against Thornburg. Murphy told Richardson and Hamilton that he was sorry to say 
that there was nothing implausible about any of the claims, including the claim by Michael Wikinishudo that he had modified promise for U.S. intelligence on an Indian reservation in Southern California, that the available evidence made it look like an NSA operation, that if it were an NSA operation, it would explain Thornburg's behavior because Thornburg would not have needed to receive a call from the White House to know that his job was to stonewall until the cows came home. Elliot Richardson passed away at the end of 1999. In 2001, Hamilton contacted Admiral Murphy again and gave him an approximately 50-page Inslaw summary of evidence revealing that the Justice Department began misappropriating promise in 1982 for three separate intelligence projects. One. NSA's deployment of promise to banks to enable NSA to track wire transfers of money and letters of credit. Two, Israeli intelligence sales of a trapdoor version of promise to foreign governments so Israel and the United States could covertly intercept their intelligence secrets. Mm -hmm. And three, the CIA's deployment of promise throughout the U.S. government as the standard database software for the gathering and disseminating of U.S. intelligent information. Murphy told Hamilton that the Inslaw summary eliminated any doubt about what had happened and that the Inslaw case needed to be settled. He warned Hamilton, however, that government officials would regard it as their patriotic duty to look Inslaw's lawyer in the eyes and lie making it essential that Inslaw find another outstanding lawyer like Elliot Richardson to represent the company in seeking compensation. Shortly before introducing Mr. and Mrs. Hamilton to C. Boyd and Gray, one week after the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks, and asking Gray to become the John Adams of the Inslaw case, that's how we put it, wow. and represent Inslaw simply because it was the right thing to do. Murphy said something to Hamilton that Hamilton now suspects suspects may have been an allusion to the use of the NSA bank surveillance version of promise to launder drug profits. Now, drugs are involved. This is still a quote, guys. I'm sorry. In September 2001, Murphy, who had served as chief of staff to Vice President Bush during the first term of the Reagan administration, when the promise misappropriations began, told Hamilton that this was his hunch that there was still another use of promise that Insta had not yet discovered, that it involves something so seriously wrong that money alone cannot cure the problem, and that the government might never compensate Insta unless the company discovers that additional use of promise. Unfortunately, Admiral Murphy passed away suddenly several days later in September 21st, 2001. And Hamilton was never able to obtain clarification from Murphy where his hunch had originated from relative to the, the other use of promise that Insta had not yet discovered. And we don't know what it was? No. As a postscript, Bill Hamilton later mentioned to me that in retrospect, he had come to believe that the other use of promise involved laundering money from drug profits. He said he believed that the main role of the Cabezon Wackenhut joint venture was connected to government sanctioned drug trafficking and money laundering by organized crime groups like the Gambino family and groups like the Contras. And that Michael Wiccanoshudo's job was to help these groups access NSA's bank surveillance versions of promise to launder the proceedings from those drug uses. Are you Unquote. kidding me? Unquote. Unquote. Yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yes. Wow. Yeah. How? So now we got the mafia pulled in too. I just pulled them. I just got them. I just oh punched them out of the air. <laughs> the tentacles. So what do you think of the, the possibility of that? So uh, just a real quick recap, because I quoted a lot there, and I'm sorry, a lot of technical stuff going on here, and it may be hard to whatever, and I'm trying my best to read it right. But Elliot Richardson, the hotshot good guy lawyer that said, fuck you, Nixon. I'm not going to join your Watergate. Um, old timer, knows a lot of shit. Um, Try to help Inslaw. And when he discovered that the attorney general 
basically summarizing this for everyone. When he discovered that the attorney general at the time, Thornburg, was stonewalling him, he asked an admiral, an admiral friend of his who knows his shit in the intelligence community. He had held uh, top jobs. He was holding top jobs when he asked him um, about this. Like, hey, can you read my, my stuff here? See if it's plausible and what's going on with this attorney general, like not talking to me. And he's like, yes, it's, it's very plausible that this could be happening. And it could explain that maybe it's an NSA operation because of the way he's stonewalling you because it's just natural or common to stonewall anyone who's asking questions like that they don't need uh the the say so from the white house to just say no to you and not investigate okay and then from there Elliot richardson at some point 1999 like i said he died because he, he's an old man too he just died from natural causes um and so in 2001 you know inslaw bill hamilton sent a 50 page like summary like the way i'm doing the show sent it over to him to this admiral guy right and this admiral like then he figured out like hey there's some other stuff going on here and this is the last part that i was talking about about the drug angle and the money laundering and all these other the last part basically so i'm just trying to like timeline it a little bit for everyone but before he could actually say something really big about it he died in um just a week or so after 2000 uh, after 9 11 basically wow yeah is the, died suddenly suddenly right are we air quoting died suddenly or we know no, that it was he natural. just died suddenly he was okay. already but like okay. pretty still kind of suspect i don't know if there was i don't know anything about it, like if he had an autopsy or nothing like that so, okay. sorry about that one i guess no <clears> no <throat> now the case continued after that not to mention the many details i gave hints to <laughs> or otherwise ignored for the sake of time but I'll save some of Insaw's findings in the 2000s for the next show. We're not finished with the 80s and 90s quite yet, not by a long shot. Hmm. Before I proceed with the next segment, I want to talk a little about Bill Hamilton. This Insaw section says a lot about Hamilton that I didn't say out loud, that he's tenacious, tenacious and a victim of epic monetary and intelligence abuse by what we're calling the octopus. Keep in mind, that the purpose, if the purpose of this organization, again, unofficially, is to make money. And that it is those illegal ways to make money through companies like Inslaw is what makes them a group working in unison, even if they themselves don't acknowledge it. Remember what I said about at the top of the show? Conspiracies allow for deriv derivative liability where conspirators can also be punished for the illegal acts carried out by other members even if they're not directly involved. Yeah. Thus, were one or more members of the conspiracy committing illegal acts to further the conspiracy's goals, all members of the conspiracy may be held accountable for those acts. That's the definition. This is what's happening. A darker and further reason for the octopus to exist is that they are also manipulating current events to suit their political interests. Think of Wackenhut's politically motivated stance and how it influenced their clients. Their clientele, right? How promise was being sold to foreign countries to potentially spy on them. This is, of course, way before Edward Snowden's whistleblowing on the NSA for spying on Americans. Good point. Mm -hmm. How long have they been doing it? Jesus. Mm -hmm. How long have they been trying, succeeding, failing? You know, Hamilton wow. is fighting the ocean here, meaning he probably will not win. But he's one of the main reasons we are here today as well. He was Cherry Seymour's source for her 20 year in the making book that I've been quoting this whole time. He spoke to Rachel Begley, the daughter of one of the victims in California's triple murders that made her a believer of the octopus and led face to face to her dad's killer. At least one of them, you know, uh, Jimmy Hughes, Jimmy Hughes, right? Mm -hmm. Hamilton and Danny Casalera played chess over the phone for fuck's sake. I mentioned that also. Not. <laughs> this connection led to prominent government figures like Elliot Richardson to speak up for Casalero when he was found dead in 91. Everything is connected. here. When he was found suicided. Yeah. Everything is connected here. So are we saying the octopus is the NSA? No. But it's one of them. Maybe like a long time ago. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I would say no. 
If you're asking me point blank, what do I think based on everything I read? I would say no. Okay. I'm still putting the pieces together, trying it's to figure okay. it out. You know, it's okay. Hopefully it's not like there's a hierarchy like- either. I don't think, you know, it's like, um, okay. We're just going to wait on part three on that one. Sure, sure. Okay. Anyway. I'm just, you know, hopefully, the listeners are doing the same thing I am. It's just trying to put the pieces just together to and figure out who. Yeah, I hope. Yeah, hopefully, it's yeah, yeah. passable. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, the third segment here. I'm going to start. <clears throat> it's called Michael Rick and the Shooter. Rick and the Shooter. Hmm. Now, this might be the best time to bring Castellero's other prime source, Michael Rick and the Shooter. Through a man named Jeff Steinberg, Bill Hamilton was put in touch with Rick and Asciutto on May 18th, 1990. This was when Hamilton was told of the startling dimensions of Inslaw's case. This covert player told Hamilton how Promise was stolen from him and how he personally modified Promise while, while being you know, research director of a joint venture of the Cabazon Indian tribe through Wackenhut. Quote, we can assure or reveal that part of his job in the modification of the software had been to create a backdoor access for spying into the files of his users. These users included Great Britain, South Korea, Japan, Jordan, Canada, Israel, Egypt, and Iraq. Holy shit. Bill Hamilton tallied the figure at as many as 88 countries for use in such activities as the tracking of terrorists. According to Rico Nishudo, Attorney General Edwin Meese had provided promise to Dr. Earl Bryan and Peter Vidnix from the Department of Justice, who had then supervised the Wackenhut Cabazon project to copy the program, unquote. That's a wild ass shit. It really so, is. Let me just stop for a second and say, 88, it's like, the crazy 88, right? I mean, that's okay. It's the crazy 88. It really, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Rick and Ashuda was very impressed by the functionality of the program. Harry Martin, tech journalist, tested an Israeli software package which utilized Promise and marveled its ability to deal with a complete military structure, meaning the numbers and the details. Promise wasn't the only bombshell he dropped on Hamilton, though. Through many phone conversations, he talked about the Cabazon Wackenhut venture and production of advanced weaponry, like biological weapons and facts, which are fuel air explosives. We can assure that also had wild claims that there were that were more difficult to corroborate, though some kind of did. He claimed he and Earl Bryan were involved in the October surprise conspiracy, as well as the Nugan Hand Bank scandal, which involved some very shady people. That one has some shady shit. This is interesting, because if a figure like Rick Oshudo is to be believed, then he has a treasure trove of information that appeals to conspiracy theorists, but also works as a double-edged sword for the rest of the world, as they find it hard to believe such allegations. What do you think? Have you heard of those Nugan Hand Bank? Well, not the not the Nugan Hand Bank, but the September Surprise. October. Oh God! <laughs> I, I was looking you're, at you're my, only off by one. I was looking at my computer clock. <laughs> you're looking at your <laughs> fucking web calendar and shit. <laughs> the October Surprise. Okay, history. Don't laugh. Was history. that was that with Reagan? Uh, I'm gonna say yes. Is that when? Hostages were released. Yes, pretty good. Wow, you was remember? It, Wait, you old. old? You old? Uh, that's I'm right. That's true. Yes, so far you're right. Fucking I mean, you're right, doggy. Um, yeah. Were they Olympians? Oh no, ah, yeah. I don't okay. think so. That that much I don't think so. It was the, no, the, no, no. this conspiracy behind that was that Reagan had the ability to get the hostages out, but he held it. Until wow, pretty right good. after he became president or, or during his election, something like that. Yeah, to yep, help you him almost become got president. It. Yeah, I'm not gonna yeah, tell yeah. you because uh, it's something for later, but I did want to mention that as one of his one of Rick and Ashuto's wilder uh allegations. But like I said, they also hold merit, and I mentioned the two that kind of do hold merit on purpose. I'm weaving a web here, guys. 
But yeah, Jay's basically right. Search it up, guys. It's pretty crazy. Also, not that long of a conspiracy if you <laughs> if you're worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Okay. All right. <clears throat> By late 1990, Hamilton had told Danny Castellaro all about Rico Nashudo. Castellaro became very intrigued and started looking into him. Here's some of what he found and what's actually true of Rico Nashudo's background. He had demonstrated some technical and scientific talents. The following was originally published in the Village Voice. Quote, Rico Nashudo was a gifted child. When he was just 10 years old, Michael wired his parents' neighborhood's parents' neighborhood with a working private telephone system that Jeez. undercut Ma Bell. That's why he worked at, in Ma Bell. At 10 years old? Yeah. At 10 years old, I was eating worms. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the dirt. Yeah. That's, why, that's why we're plebes. That's why. Um, anyway. In the eighth grade, he won a science fair with a model for a three-dimensional sonar system. Wow. By the time he was a teenager, he had won so many science fairs with exhibits of laser technology that he was invited to be a summer research assistant at Stanford University. Dr. Arthur Shallow, a Nobel laureate, remembers him, quote within the quote, you don't forget a 16-year-old youngster who shows up with his own argon laser, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> Unquote both ends, by the way. That's a real unquote. I didn't know how to do this fucking citing shit. Sorry. Getting excited here. Sometime after leaving Stanford University, Rikun Oshuda went to work in an underground newspaper in San Francisco where he had acquired some photos which showed a narcotics agent having sex with an underage girl. Oh. This was printed in the newspaper, and Rikun Oshuda said that this led him to being framed on drug charges which led to a two-year prison sentence in 1973 for manufacturing psychedelic drugs. Casalero didn't believe this, though, this whole frame-up thing, and he questioned other claims, but still found his connections to Insta to be worth the look. Casalero never wrote it down, but I and others, other conspiracy theorists, I mean, and journalists, uh, have gotten the impression that he thought Rick and Oshudo tended to embellish quite a bit. His sentence was true, to be sure, his two-year sentence, I mean. And it did affect later endeavors for him. But whether or not he was a frame-up, that's where Kessler right. doesn't really believe so much. Quote, <clears throat> one excerpt from the 11-page letter referred to a meeting in May 1981 at the U.S. Army installation at Dover, New Jersey, between Robert Fry, Vice President of Wackenhut in Indio, Michael Wickenoshudo, John P. Nichols, which is the Cabazon administrator, uh -huh. Peter Zukowski, former president of ArmTech in India, which produced combustible cartridges cases in the Army, and Dr. Harry Fair, the Army's lead engineer on the railgun project at Picatinny Arsenal. I like that, Picatinny. Cannon noted that Rikuna Shudo and several Army personnel conducted an extensive and highly techno technical theoretical blackboard exercise on the railgun, and afterwards, Dr. Fair commented that he was extremely impressed with Rikun Oshudo's scientific and technical knowledge in this matter. Cannon further wrote, Dr. Fair had apparently been apprised by Nichols that Rikun Oshudo had been convicted and served time for stabbing a DEA agent whom he purportedly caught in bed with Rikun Oshudo's wife. Oh, my God. Dr. Fair had, a, had commented that Rikun Oshudo would probably not be able to ever get a government security clearance because of his past, but, but it would be a shame if Rikun Oshudo, whom he termed a potential national resource, could not be used for military research projects in his field of expertise, unquote. Wow. Now, I couldn't get the arrest report at anything like that, but my understanding since the majority of this quote comes from Dr. Fair, it's likely that he was told that Rikun Oshudo was charged for stabbing a federal officer, not that it was for manufacturing drugs. I do not know why this lie or potential lie was given to Dr. Fair to then have it be written in this report that I'm quoting, only that I assume it's either to make Rikun Oshudo more threatening 
or easier to work than a drug addict? Who can say? Wow. What do you think? It is conflicting evidence. It's, well, yeah. Um, For sure. I don't know what to think. No, right. I know. But who can say? That's, that should be mentioned and that I don't know also. It's good to know what I don't know. Right. Right. Okay. But Kessler thought this was a shady character. Didn't trust Yeah, or like, you know, an embellisher at least or something like he likes talking. Maybe too much. Okay. Again, he doesn't say like that ever. Ever. Not that I've ever read it. Or his friends say about it. I mean, I'm about to say right now. Let me just get to the next part. Yeah. <laughs> I to absolutely explain something. Castellaro's eyes were open when he and Hamilton discussed these connections, but they were open wider in 1991 by what Rickenshooter was saying. For example, a contact of his by the name of Alan Standorf said he worked at a secret military electronics listening post in Virginia and managed to supply Castellaro with classified information regarding the Enslaw case. Many stipulate that those papers were among what went missing from his hotel room mm. when he died, like among the many papers. Bill Hamilton and Danny Casalero convinced Rikuno Shudo to tell his story on the record, which he, we, know, we know by now that he did. On March 21st, 1991, he filed a sworn affidavit on the Enslaw case, and it provides a, a toehold for Castellero's research. I'm going to read a good portion of the affidavit, but not all of it because it's long. Quote, <clears throat> I, Michael J. Wikunashudo, being duly sworn, do hereby state as follows. One, during the early 80s, I served as director of research for a joint venture between the Wackenhut Corporation of Coral Gables, Florida, and the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians, California, in Indio, California. The joint venture was located on the reservation. Three, the Cabazon Band of Indians are a sovereign nation. The sovereign immunity that is accorded to Cabazons as a consequence of this fact made it feasible to pursue on the reservation the development and or manufacture of materials whose development or manufacture would be subject to stringent controls off the reservation. As a minority group, the Cabazon Indians also provided the Wackenhout Corporation with an enhanced ability to obtain federal contracts through the 8A set-aside program and in connection with government-owned contract-operated facilities. Four, the Wackenhut Cabazon joint venture was intended to support the needs of a number of foreign governments and forces, including forces and governments in Central America and the Middle East. The Contras in Nicaragua represented one of the most important priorities for the joint venture. Five, the Wackenhut Cabazon joint venture maintained close liaison with certain elements of the United States government, including representatives of intelligence, military, and law enforcement agencies. Six, among the frequent visitors of the Wackenhut Cabazon joint venture were Peter Videnix of the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., and a close associate of Videnix by the name of Earl W. Bryan. Mm. Bryan is a private businessman who lives in Maryland and who has maintained close business ties with the U.S. intelligence community for many years. Nine, some of the modifications that I made were specifically designed to facilitate the implementation of promise within two agencies of the government of Canada, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and the Canadian Security and Intelligence Services. Earl W. Bryan would check with me from time to time to make certain that the work could be completed in time to satisfy the schedule for these Canadian intelligence services. 10. The proprietary versions of Promise, as modified by me, was, in fact, implemented in both the RCMP and the CSIS in Canada. Those are the acronyms. Sorry, guys. That's the acronym for the, the, the agencies I just mentioned that are long. <laughs> it was my understanding that Earl W. Bryan had sold this version of Promise to the government of Canada. 11. In February 1991, I had a telephone conversation with Peter Vindnix, then still employed by the U.S. Department of Justice. 
Bidenix attempted during this telephone conversation to persuade me not to cooperate with an independent investigation of the government's piracy of Inslaw's proprietary promise software being conducted by the Committee on the Judiciary of U.S. House of Representatives. 12. Vidinik stated that I will be rewarded for a decision not to cooperate with the House Judiciary Committee investigation. Vidinik forecasted an immediate and favorable resolution of a protracted child custody dispute being prosecuted against my wife by her former husband if I were to decide not to cooperate with the House Judiciary Committee investigation. 13. Vidinix also outlined specific punishments that I could expect to receive from the U.S. Department of Justice if I cooperated with the House Judiciary Committee's investigation, unquote. Those specific punishments was involving uh, Rick Gunasciuto and his father in a criminal prosecution of business associates in Orange County, California. Another punishment Vidinix threatened is perjury by the DOJ, saying that credible witnesses would become would come forward to contradict any damaging claims he would make. Wow. It was easier to paraphrase the last few parts there. And, you know, and the ones that I skipped earlier were basically things I covered already on the show. So let's skip the little thing here. Yeah. Within eight days of this testimony, guess what happened? Just guess. I'm just going to give, give you a little minute. <laughs> give you a little minute. What do you think happened within eight days of this testimony, this affidavit? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Michael Wickenashuda was arrested for conspiracy to manufacture, conspiracy to distribute, possession with intent to distribute, <sighs> and with distribution, a total of 10 counts related to methamphetamine and methadone. What? Mm-hmm. Bogus or real? Uh, I think bogus or at least partly. His claims of being framed went on deaf ears, obviously, and spent the grand majority of his time as a source for people like Castellaro, Hamilton, and Seymour behind bars. It should go without saying that this charge damaged his credibility with the Enslaw case. Oh, 100%. Mm-hmm. This is from Seymour. Quote, for three months, we can Oshudo called daily from the Pierce County Jail in Tacoma, Washington. At his request, I attach a tape recorder to my phone and unravel a complicated web of illegal overseas arms shipments, espionage, CIA drug trafficking, biological warfare development, computer software de- theft, money laundering, and corruption at the highest levels of government. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Like, what do you even say? I, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> you know now? Um, yeah, I, you know, I mean, the great thing about it is that, okay, as I mentioned this part, I didn't write this. It's not a script. None of this is in the script, what I'm about to say. So every time I mention this, there's a bunch of times in this show and in the last show, I quoted or have myself have paraphrased versions, paraphrased versions of the information that leads into a list of shit. Of illegal <laughs> things. Yeah. This is like my, my eighth time probably where I mentioned here. I just record real quick. At his request, I attach a tape recorder to my phone, right? Unraveling a complicated web of illegal overseas. Here comes a list. Army shipments, espionage, CIA drug trafficking, biological work, right? All this stuff that I'm saying. There's like, I've said so many different ones and yet some of them are the same. And by now, I'm hoping that you're trying to see like, oh, I know that one. I don't know that one. I know that one. I don't know that one. I know that. One. And that's the point. Wow. You, I'm trying to like get you like to get the first time I said this in the very first opening of the first show, last show. You have no idea. You're like what? How is all <laughs> this involved? And by now, you know, half of it. That's right. And that's kind of the point. That's why I keep quoting these people and the way that I'm doing it. Hopefully that's coming across. I'm just pulling it now because it might be too subtle. Anyway. Because uh, you, by now you know, say drug trafficking. Okay, we did mention that earlier. That could be something. Biological warfare. Well, yeah, the fucking Cabazon thing. Computer software. Fucking promise right there. Money laundering. We don't know everything yet, but it was mentioned. Right. So you know things yeah. like that. So just amazing. Right. So, I mean, at the beginning of the show, you had no idea what half of that meant. Now you know half of it. So anyway, so that is 
Michael Wikinoshiro's section. But his influence on this case is, is far from over. Because of those crazy allegations he made, there's going to be more from him in part three. Between Wackenhut and the Inslaw case, we covered a great portion of what Danny Kessler was searching and researching. And if you believe he was murdered, is what eventually led to his death. Unfortunately, at best, we're only halfway. Covering everything will actually result in a book or two, and that's not me. There are prominent names to spill and further details on the ones I brought up for sure, but I can't write no book. So now I have teased how drugs comes into this earlier, but what's the bigger picture here? I mean, whatever you think, hopefully is what I get to do. Two sections were left out of the original outline. This is to have a meteor part, like a meteor part three, but also because I need further understanding to write a better segment. Expect to find some connections to the Reagan administration, like how Reagan won the election to the Iron Contra scandal. Expect a look into the BCCI scandal, which involved millions of dollars in many countries. I will also talk about the lesser reported and strange deaths, deaths of people either involved in the octopus or trying to expose it. This goes hand in hand with, with Rikunoshiro's allegations as well. Lastly, I will be exploring the origins of this organization, what people called it before Danny Casalero named it, and how much deeper it all goes. Join us again next time for the octopus tendrils.